How's everybody doing today? Good. Good. Is everybody's mind completely blown from all the stuff? You all have a bad case of information overload. You need you need to look at your badge to find out to remember what your name is. You've got so much information running around in your head. Okay. Well, sit back and relax. This is uh, this is hopefully going to be a great deal of fun. Um, yeah, if you go ahead and do the introduction. Uh, welcome to Linux Fest 2012. This session here is called uh, Security Worst Practices, and uh, this is Gary Smith. Okay. Thank you for coming. Uh, let's see. Yeah. And okay. And let's see. The pointer. 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 Where's the pointer? Ah, oh, there's the pointer. Great. And. Oof. Okay, this is Security Worst Practices. My name is Gary Smith. Um, my information is up there, but our slide template doesn't make it very big. So, I am the Information Security Officer, and yes, that, that is the title that I have, at Molecular Science Computing inside the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy laboratory where we do all sorts of interesting stuff with um, things like how various pollutants move through the soil, aerosol chemistry, all sorts of high-powered molecular chemistry, um, things in relating to the environment. And if you're going to have um, data sets that are terabytes and petabytes in nature, you need a supercomputer to munge this stuff into some kind of meaningful result. That's where I come in. I am charged with the security for the supercomputer that we have there at uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, when we got it uh, three years ago, it was number 23 in the top 500. Uh, technology has moved on and it is now um, about somewhere between number 40 and number 50. Uh, here are pictures of some of our various researchers doing, doing their stuff. Um, I get a lot of email and one of the things that I get a lot of email on is security work best practices. I get at least one email a week some, about some security best practice or the other. Security best practice for passwords, or security best practice for managing users, or security best practices for databases, or security best practices for voice over IP. Okay, well, we got a lot of them. Best ones for doing DDoS mitigation, best practices for security in Linux and Unix. I get constantly inundated with these, maybe you get them too. Um, it kind of depends on what mailing list you're on. But I keep getting the same old best practices. They keep coming around, it's almost like on a, on a repeti repetitious scale. But we don't seem to be learning anything from them. If you don't believe this is true, why do we keep getting SQL injection exploits? You would think that by now, after 10 years worth, we would be getting SQL injections anymore. What about buffer overflows? I figured out buffer overflows when I was in graduate school. I won't tell you how long ago that's been, but it's been some time. But we're still getting buffer overflows. Why are they succeeding? Maybe it's because we need to do something different. So, I decided that the same old security maxims aren't working for us. What we need is we need something new. What do we need? Well, here's what I put on the slide so I could get this past the reviewers. <laughs> I remembered 
this old aphorism about there's nothing as ever a total loss, it can always be used as a bad example. That's well, that's hey, that partly true. Um, what my real inspiration was was something I remembered from when I lived in Texas. Texas has this neat thing, um, if you get a speeding ticket, you can take a defensive driving class and if you pass the defensive driving class they will expunge the speeding ticket from your record. Well what they usually had for people teaching the defensive driving class is they had a DPS trooper or they had maybe somebody from the public school and it was dull, boring and dry. They had very poor success rate on people passing and they also had extremely high recidivism of people showing up again because they didn't learn anything when they did pass the class. And then somebody in Dallas got this brilliant idea instead of having a dry, dull, boring class, let's get comedians to do the teaching instead and they'll make fun of all of these bad driving things and people might actually enjoy the class instead of sleeping through it and they might actually pass the class. Well, sure enough they did this. They got stand-up comics to deliver the material once they got certified to teach and sure enough the pass rate went up. And so did recidivism. That's what? <laughs> and so did what? I'm sorry? Recidivism. And, and well, recidivism went down because the pass rate went up because people were staying awake in the class and they were, they were remembering stuff. So I thought, well, okay, maybe this is what we, we should do. We should look at how to get good security practices by studying bad security practices. So, in the words of Monty Python, and now for something completely different. Um, looking at bad security is good because it lets us look at, it gives us this opportunity to see how somebody messed something up. Um, the learning experience that we get from this is reinforced because we can laugh about how somebody was stupid and all the time thinking, mm, you know, I do exactly the same thing, maybe I shouldn't do that. But we get a laugh at somebody else's expense. Um, Winston Churchill is one of my favorite guys for, for quotes. Uh, Winston Churchill said, um, all men make mistakes, but it's the wise men that learn from them. Um, that's what I hope to do here is look at other people's mistakes and learn from them. So uh, Winston Churchill also said that the Americans and the British are the only people separated by common language. Uh, that's really true. So what we'll do is we'll look at security worst practices Think about them a little bit. No, I know that's going to be hard to do on a Sunday afternoon after having your mind blown. But think about the worst practices and how we can make those into best practices. So, with that in mind, let's begin our journey to wisdom on the best practices. Now, uh, cybersecurity mission plan and action plan. Does your organization that does cybersecurity have a mission plan? What is their cybersecurity mission statement? Is this their cybersecurity mission statement? Cybersecurity. We put the no in innovation. Boy, I don't know how many times I have dealt with security people that the first thing out of their mouth is no. It's a nice day outside. No. Stay like that. That's their automatic reaction to regardless of any question you ask them is no. They put the no in innovation. Does your cybersecurity organization have an action plan? What's their action plan? This could very well be their action plan. Cybersecurity. We're pros at procrastination. I'll just sit on this and, and let it wait. It'll go away eventually. They'll forget about it. That's a lot of places, action security plan. What's the best practice that we can get out of this? Anybody want to venture a guess? Okay. Make policies your users can live with so they won't try to route around you as a problem. 
That's a good one. That's very good. Uh, yes? That's right. Engage your users. Don't disengage from them. Engage your users. Now one of the things I want to use in here is case studies. Think about how cybersecurity works. And this is a case study. This is a, a worst practice. What's wrong with this picture? Okay, notice what they've done. Bathroom stalls with expensive combination locks to prevent people who shouldn't be getting in to use the bathroom from using the bathroom. What's wrong? You can still get in by going through here. Well, maybe so. But maybe this is an executive washroom. Maybe they don't want anybody but executives to use the washroom. What's that? <laughs> yeah. That's a, That's another perfectly valid uh, 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 security principle. Bypass. But you can bypass by going through the little slot there. The drain the floor. Oh, the floor. Yeah, if they got a drain. What, what's the worst practice here? The worst practice, I say, is overspend on the normal way in, but never consider the the bypass, and as, as somebody over here pointed out. Okay, what's the what's the best practice or better practice? Better practice might be yes. What? Lock on the door. Um, that's a possibility. I think a, a, a better practice is is don't overspend on the obvious, but consider the unobvious. Well, you're, you're talking to a Linux group here, so the obvious solution would just be open door policy. Yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> exactly. Very good. Very good. Okay. Um, just, just publish the key. Public. Sure. <laughs> well, fine. Yeah, publish the key. Public key cryptography. Um, what are some general security worst practices? Here's an easy one. Expect end users to forego convenience for the sake of security. Never. Boy, that's, that's, that's just never going to happen. People are not going to give up security for, for convenience. Um, yeah, this is one I see all the time. You lock down your infrastructure so tight that you can't get meaningful business work done anymore. That happens all the time. Okay. Uh, I'll call your attention to this one because we'll see something about this later on towards the end. People will spend tremendous amounts of time, money, effort trying to lock things down, putting all kinds of preventative mechanisms into place, but they never look at a log. They don't know when something bad has happened. Um, Okay, how many times has anybody applied a patch and it's not worked? Yes, happens all the time, doesn't it? This is one that I see a lot. People don't educate, keep themselves educated. What's the latest thing that is going on? I have a bunch of hacker sites that I go out to semi-periodically just to look and see what may be of interest. This is one of my favorite ones. The IT staff hates the security staff and the security staff hates the IT staff. The IT staff think the security people just want to prevent me from doing my job. The security staff think the IT staff is a bunch of idiots because they don't know how to run their systems. You need to have cross-pollination between the two so that they each understand some piece of the other white guy's work so that they don't end up hating each other and turning their backs on each other. Okay. Uh, a, couple, a couple more. <sighs> security policy. Assume that the users are going to read the security policy because you've asked them to. Maybe they'll read the security policy if they have insomnia. <laughs> oh gee, I can't get to sleep. Where's that security policy? Hmm, the user should... 
and immediately they've gone to sleep. Um, another good one in terms of general security. Boy, templates, they're great. But what do people do? They just put them out there, they never customize them, they don't ever look at them, and away they go. Uh, another one that's real popular, creating a security policy that you cannot enforce. Um, I don't have one here, but uh, USB drives. Oh, okay, do you have one? Don't use Dropbox or similar. Sure, yeah. How, how, can you, how can you enforce that? Um, uh, users want to back up their stuff because they're afraid that they're going to lose it. So what do they do? They buy a, uh, a 32 gigabyte USB drive for $9.95 down at Fry's and they back the stuff up to the USB. But your security policy says don't use non-approved USB devices. Well, it may be that it's a real hassle to get a, US, uh, a good USB device at, uh, at your site. Uh, it's too much trouble. So people take the easy way out. They buy the cheapy uh, USB drive and it comes with a virus on it and guess what. Um, another one, enforce policies that are not properly approved. I see this frequently. Um, any thoughts on what a, a general uh, sort of good security practice from this would be? All of these? Think about your policy. Make sure your policy makes sense. Okay. Oh. Oh, I almost forgot. This is one of my favorite ones. I call this checkbox security. Do you have a firewall? Yes. Do you have an IDS? Yes. My firewall may have the default rules that it came with. My IDS? Well, I'm not sure anybody's ever turned it on, but I've got one. Um, how many people have read or have seen Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Oh boy, lots of people. Good. Remember, remember in um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, Arthur has uh, try. Arthur Dent has tried to get hold of the plans that's going to put uh, a, uh, a bypass through his house, and it's at the bottom of a basement with the uh, lights turned off, and uh, it's behind a locked door in a cabinet, and the sign on the door says, "Beware the leopard." Well, we do the same thing with security policies. We make sure that the users can't find the policies to know about them. Happens all the time. People don't know where they are and how can a, how can a user be responsible for something that he knows absolutely nothing about. This is another good one. Assume that what, you, what worked last year works this year. May not be true. Okay. Um, this is always a good one. Assume that being compliant means that you're secure. Lots of us have to deal with things like FISMA for federal information systems, or pay card industry, PCI, or HIPAA if you're in uh, medical records. And each of those have sets of compliance rules that you're supposed to do. You get those done and that's all you ever do. Just being compliant does not make you secure. Um, this one is particularly true. Security policies don't apply to the executive staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah you speak from personal experience. Yeah, I, I've got one on that too. Um, security is for everybody. It's not just it doesn't just apply, it does not apply to the executives. Uh, you may be in a situation where you have an executive who, uh, although your policy says, password? pardon? Has a three-letter password? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> doing a great lead-in here. Um, doing a great lead-in here. She, she's almost like a warm-up band at, 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 the, at the concert. But um, your, your policy may say that, uh, you, you don't go out to eBay. 
but you've got an executive that is running a secondary business off of eBay. Um, the last one that I like, hide from the auditors. The auditors come, oops, time to take vacation, I'm out of here. Okay, um, let's look at a case study, an IDS management intrusion detection system. So you're the security officer, auditor, and you're walking around, and you see this guy using a laptop, and you say, hi there, what are you doing on the laptop? And the employee says, oh, I'm monitoring my firewall and IDS with my laptop. And being the good security auditor, you say, where's the ethernet cable for the laptop? There's no ethernet cable, so how's he doing the auditing and configuration on the IDS and the firewall if there's no ethernet cable? And the employee says, oh, there's no cable, it's wireless, ain't that cool, dude? Okay. The auditor does a little bit of checking and then he finds out that the laptop has not been secured at all. It's not even running the latest sets of patches. The OS and its apps haven't been patched in ages. Oh great, and it gets even better. It gets even better. <laughs> the wireless network he's using is some kind of ad hoc thing that he just threw together and was unsecured and it's broadcasting its SSID in the clear. Oh boy. Why did this happen? This happened because somebody didn't want to be in front of the console and they thought this was better. What can we learn from this and have as a good as a as a better practice? Is educating better, Mike. Education, that's education is a good one. Um, I like to think of this one as match the security, match the access level required to get to the device to the security level of the device. The IDS and the firewall need to be highly secure devices, so their access needs to be highly secure also. Um, I do a lot of log management, and I look at the logs regularly, but there's a lot of log management worst practices. And this is one of the biggest ones. Don't log anything. And I've heard lots of excuses on this. One, it takes up a lot of disk space. Yeah. I mean, come on people. I can go down to Fry's and buy a one terabyte disk for $99. Give me a break. Don't tell me that there's no space. The other one, it takes up too much network bandwidth. I can buy one, one gigabit is common. Who needs to worry about network bandwidth? Maybe you do have logs. Maybe you don't fall into this category of not logging at all. What's the other, other part of that? Not looking at the logs at all. You need to look at the logs. That needs to be in somebody's job description that they are looking at the logs. Another one, which goes back to the first one. It takes so much tip, too much disk space. So what we're going to do is we're going to prune the logs off after a week. Not good. Keep the logs around for at least three months. Disk space is cheap. You can archive them. Generally speaking, logs are text data. Boy, does that compress well. Um, one gigabyte's worth of uh, textual log material will collapse down into a few hundred uh, megabytes or less with just a little bit of compression. One of the things that people do with logs is they decide what the priority of the message is before it's all collected together. Um, the good thing to do is to collect all of your logs to a central point and you've got everything in one place so that you can go through and look at all of them together. But some people prioritize the stuff they think is important before it ever gets to the centralized server. People log system stuff all the time. They log network stuff. But they don't always log application stuff and that can be extremely important. Things like Apache logs. MySQL logs, um, 
any kind of database logging. They need to keep that up. Um, this one, silos, stovepipes. My Apache logs go over here. My sys logs go over here. My application logs go over here. But there's no way to interconnect when you're trying to look at when something bad has happened to get the big picture from all of them because they're all together. And one of the worst ones, and unfortunately I have been guilty of this, is I only look at what is I know to be bad. Bad stuff, I'm only care, I only care, I know what's bad, so I'll just keep looking at the bad stuff. But I won't ever go back and look for what may be new bad stuff. Database worst practices, talking about databases. DBAs are frightful people. They worry that the database is not going to continue to work. So what do they do? They don't patch the database because they're afraid that it's not going to work. Rogue databases, that happens all the time. They proliferate like dandelions. People will, the DBA will create a little scratch database and he'll just leave it out there. And maybe it has some company data in it, some sensitive data, and he forgets about it. Proliferation of rogue databases like that can be very bad because they usually don't have a lot of protection on them. They're just for a trial. They're just there for short term. People forget about them. This is not just about databases, but granting excessive privileges. Sure, grant all on star dot star user at localhost. Bam! That's just as bad as giving everybody root. You need to limit the privileges that people have. Um, this one is a really bad one. Username and password common those are their default very are their default. Like Oracle Oracle. That's a real fun one. Um, I have uh, quite a few I have some systems that are out there on the wild and woolly internet and I track what people use as combinations for trying to break in. And Oracle Oracle is a really popular one. Uh, another one that is almost as bad is where the username equals the database name equals the password. It's easy to remember. It's bad. Um, the ostrich syndrome. Stick your head in the sand with what users are doing, how the databases are being used, and what kind of data, what kind of vulnerabilities they may be subject to. Um, here's another bad one. Allow arbitrary internet condition, connections and user input. I've got a database out there on my uh, on, on on one of my internet servers. And I'll let anybody from the internet connect to it. No, you need to limit through any number of any number of ways who can connect to the database. User input. I don't sanitize any of my user input coming in. Buffer overflows. SQL injection happens all the time. <laughs> this is the one that that, that um, D DBAs are particularly scared of. They don't want to encrypt their database somebody gets hold of the database, if it's encrypted, it doesn't do them any good. But the DBAs are scared that, well, if I encrypt it, gee, I may not be able to decrypt it. So that ends up being um, a, a real scary point for them. <sighs> passwords. How long have we been using passwords? Well over 2,000 years we've been using passwords for one thing or the other to grant access. <sighs> we still haven't got it right. We may have gotten to the point where we use these fancy encryption devices and we use RSA and whatnot, but we still haven't got passwords quite worked out right. Um, one of the things that happens, require your users to change their passwords too frequently. Some places say, change your password every 30 days. Well, crap. I've only gotten used, after 30 days, I've only gotten used to typing the path, got, gotten my muscular memory down, and I've got to change it again. That doesn't work. Make it 90 days. 90 days is much more reasonable. Um, <sighs> sticky notes. Mm -hmm. Sticky notes are probably the one of the bane of uh, 
security administrators and system administrators because before sticky notes, I don't know what people wrote their passwords down and stuck them on their monitor with. I guess they used uh, 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 stationary and uh, stationary and tape, but now it's too easy with sticky notes. So what do people do? You have some password policy like change it every three months, like every 30 days, and people stick their passwords on a sticky note on their monitor, and this happens all the time. Or if they're security conscious on the bottom of their keyboard. Uh, yeah, that's also good. Yeah. It, it is actually much more reasonable if you, if you have to write your security down to stick it in your wallet and put it in your back pocket or your purse rather than, and keep it on your purse and rather than the, uh, on the underside of your, uh, on the other side of your keyboard. But yeah, I've seen people do that too. Um, talking about passwords and what you're going to use for password, boy is this a one that gets overused a lot. People, some places have some really, really bad rules about what you want to have for security password. Um, it's got to have a capital letter in it, it's got to have, it's got to be at least uh, eight characters long, it's got to have a non-alphabetical character, it's got to have a digit in there, uh, it can't be one that you've used in the past three years, and so on and so forth. And finally, you end up with the situation of, well gee, I can't remember my password anymore, so what do I do? I write it on a sticky note and I put it on the monitor. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? Well, what, the flip side of that is the place where you where you go and you either enter a password and you get eight characters and they're all um, case insensitive alphabetics. Uh, yeah, that. All in the Right, that's all that, right. The system will let you enter is, uh, is, is uppercase characters or something. Um, yeah. And short. And short, yes, eight characters. I did work at a place that required 12 character passwords. Uh, it's kind of hard to type 12 characters correctly when you can't see what they are. At least I, that's for me. Um, not all your systems have the same security level, but what do a lot of people do? They require they have the same password regardless of security level for all of their systems or data criticality. Um, these devices, wonderful things, okay, but do we use better security practices on these than we use on regular stuff? Probably not. Probably not, because somebody did a study of what the most common iPhone passcodes are. Okay, I can tell you from practical experience with the project I was on that one of the, 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 the most common password that, that hackers will use to try to break into a system is one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, this is a sampling of nearly a quarter of a million iPhone passwords, so this is a very good sample size. Uh, the most common password, one, two, three, four. I was on, uh, I'll get to you just a second. I was on an airline flight a couple of months ago, and I'm on an aisle seat, and then right directly across from me at, at the angle was uh, a fellow with an iPad, and he takes out his iPad, and I can clearly see him type one, two, three, four for his password, and I thought, okay, guy, not only are you using a crappy password, you're letting everybody on the plane see it. Gee. All you have to do is look at the fingerprints on, on the screen. Anyway. What's that? All you have to do is look at the fingerprints. Yeah, the fingerprint smudges and where the fingerprints got the most smudges, that's probably where they are. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay. Zero, 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 zero. That's easy. This one. Straight down. Straight down the middle. Two, two, five, eight, zero. One, 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 one. Boy, then that's, that's an easy one. Five, 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 five. That's right in the middle. This one's a little more complicated. Five, six, eight, three. L O V E. <laughs> okay. Zero, eight, five, two. Well, that's just this one in reverse. Two, 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 two. Another real easy one. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. This one I wasn't real sure about. Why that one? Turns out a lot of people use their the year they were born for their iPhone password. So what's 2000 what's 1998 from 2012? <laughs> Gives you an idea of how of uh, of how young some of our iPhone users are. The trick is we've got, we're not using better security practices 
for our, for our most personal of devices where we're storing stuff than we are on our systems. Yes, sir. How did these folks get, uh, get a hold of the passwords for a quarter of a million uh, I have a URL at the end that you can go to and find that out. Okay, um, let's do, let's look at a case study of passwords and executives and you, you our, our lady in there will, 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 will appreciate this one. You're a security auditor and one of the tasks you've been given is the company that you're doing the audit for is concerned about users and their passwords. So you use Loftcrack, which is a nice password cracking tool for Windows. And you start going around and you find out who's got weak passwords. And you're reporting to the CEO and the CEO says, what did you find out about these, uh, these weak passwords? And you being the security auditor says, well, I discovered that your password is 87654321. This is unacceptable by virtue of your company's security policy. And the CEO says, but it's such a simple password. Nobody's going to guess that I would use a password like that. <laughs> you're the security auditor and you're thinking, holy smokes, you've got to be kidding, right? CEO says, no, I use this on all my accounts. Yahoo, Gmail, PayPal, and my ATM. <sighs> Right. What's a better practice here? Find a CEO with a clue. Find a CEO with a clue. Yeah. Use good passwords. That's kind of what I was hoping for. But yeah, this is... Yeah, I, I think maybe the thing to do is just get a CEO with a clue. That might actually be easier rather than have the better policy. Databases, da data backup. Data backup is a very important part of security because if you, if you don't have good backups, you can't really be secure. Um, the backup window that you have, do I care how long my backup runs? I've got five hours to do my backup but it takes seven hours for the backup to complete. Eh, big deal, let me worry, I don't care. Um, remember the thing about security policy, that my policy from yesterday was good for today? What I back up today is going to be what I need to back up tomorrow. Backup needs change. Run your backups manually. Boy, is this Somebody likes a lot of work if they do their backups manually. Either that or they've never heard the, of the word automation. Backups should happen automatically. Backups running manually is not something any human should be tasked with doing. Um, we all fall into this one. Run backups only when something has changed. It changes all the time. Well, yeah, it changes all the time, but you'd be surprised a lot of people don't back up their don't, don't uh, figure that, well, okay, nothing's changed, so why should I, why should I back up anything? Um, Off-site backups, that's a good thing to do, but some people do it wrong. They take their backup tapes and they throw them in the back, they throw them in their car and take them home with them. Um, as I mentioned, I, I'm from Texas, and if you threw your backup tapes in the back of your car in the middle of July, you won't have backup tapes anymore. You'll have sinkers because they won't be any good anymore. Um, for your offsite backups, offsite backups need to be secure. Um, <laughs> backing, keeping your backups in, in your car. Imagine trying to explain to somebody, well, I took the, the, the backups home and I left them in the back of my car and um, uh, somebody broke into my car in the parking lot and uh, took all of our backup tapes. Imagine trying to explain that one. Well, that's just as bad as this one. Don't physically secure your off-site backups. Um, 
here's one that I see a lot. Use the same tape over and over and over regardless of the error messages that you're getting about tape errors. This is, this is being, uh, as uh, I think Benjamin Franklin said, penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, you're trying to save a little bit on tape, but you're ignoring the messages and you're not getting a good backup. Okay, now, um, as I mentioned, you can go down to Fry's and you can get a one terabyte USB disk drive for 99 bucks. Buy that, plug that into your workstation, and start backing up and having a good time. I've got all these backups of my stuff. How do you know they're any good unless you try to restore from them? People do not test their backups. Um, small businesses, small to medium businesses. The driving force of our economy, if you, uh, if you listen to the politicians, well, what happens? What, what did they do that's a security small, that's a security worst practice? I'm too small to get hacked. What do you think most botnets are made up of? Lots and lots of computers. Lots and lots of computers, and lots and lots of those computers are point of sale cash registers running Windows 95 and 98. Mmm, <laughs> yeah, your mom and pop cash register is actually part of a botnet. I'm too small to get hacked. The, the other thinking is, is that in this I'm too small to get hacked is none of the information I have would be of interest to anybody. Customer names, credit card numbers, that alone right there makes you worthy, worthy of being hacked. Um, boy, is this an old one. SQL injection. If I had to break into a system, I'd certainly try SQL injection. SQL injection's been around and it continues to be around. Failure to patch keep, or keep a configuration. Small businesses, they don't have time to patch. They can't be bothered to patch. Besides, patching takes too much time. Letting software licenses expire. Why should I have to pay for the software? Why should I pay for the, the license? Remember what we were talking about about passwords? Utilizing poor passwords. That's a frequent thing that they do bad. GPL doesn't expire. That's true. The GPL doesn't expire, but <laughs> but not but not every business um, uh, can, can get by with GPL stuff. Um, this is a particularly important one. Letting employees browse the web unchecked. You need to see, you, th this is particularly bad. Um, reason number one, unrestricted uh, web surfing by employees can lead to embarrassing situations when um, it becomes known that your employees are surfing porn sites. This can make your company look very bad. Secondly, where do you think malware comes from? <laughs> Porn sites. <laughs> That's a unrestricted uh, web browsing can get you lots of malware loaded onto your machines. And probably related to that about why users shouldn't be uh, tracking the porn sites, not training the employees on what is good web surfing practice or good security practice at your small to medium business. Okay, let's do another case study. What's the worst practice here? <laughs> yes, that's very true. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And here I've got a zip tie holding my chain together. Um, I like to think of this one as I've applied the patch. Why should I bother to test it? It's going to work. That's the patch. That's what I think of, of as, the, as the security worst practice. Okay, how are we doing for time? Well, no, we're doing bad. Okay. Um, I've talked a lot about security worst practices. Had said we, we, we've seen a lot of bad ones. Hopefully we've, we've seen, maybe seen ourselves on, on some of these or, or see how they react. But 
what are some good practices and just a really short list and that's where I have this. This is how I like to think about security. What I call the five golden principles of security. First one, know your system. Know what runs on your system. Know who uses your system. Really easy. Anybody here remember Sun Microsystems? Now part of Oracle. What was their tagline years ago? The network is the system. Know what's on your network. Know what kind of protocols are being used. Know what kind of usage patterns you've got. That's a good way to, te to detect data that is going out of your company that you don't want to. Um, the principle of least privilege. This says, really simply, don't give people, processes, departments, groups, more access or privilege than they absolutely need. Case in point, do you really want to allow the Apache demon to be able to read Etsy Shadow? Probably not. This is not a good idea. Limit that. Don't give everybody root. Don't give everybody administrator privilege. Don't make everybody a domain admin. Don't run all demons as root. The central concept, defense in depth. Do lots of security things. Don't just do one thing, do lots of them. Think of like a tree. A tree is a bunch of concentric rings. That's how your security needs to be. A bunch of concentric rings limiting access so that when the bad guy comes in, he hits one thing and then he hits another and another and eventually he'll, he'll give up. It may not stop your, your completely determined attacker, but your average skip kitty, script kitty, poof. He tries one thing, he doesn't get in, he's gone. Um, the, um, there's a castle in, in France, in, in the town of Fougere. This castle was obviously built with this in mind because it has a double moat. The barbarians come along and they get across the first moat and they break through the wall and then they see a second moat and they go, oh no, well, let's forget this one. Let's go down to the castle down the street and attack it because it's just got one. Um, remember I was talking about logs. This goes back to that one about logs. Prevention is key, but detection is a must. You can protect your systems and wrap them in all sorts of protective layers on and on and on and on. But if you don't know that something has gone wrong, it's game over. Like the guy says in Aliens, game over, man, game over. You need to know what's going wrong. You need to have the logs collected at a central spot, and it needs to be somebody's job to look at them. The last one, know your enemy. This is right out of Sun Tzu's Art of War. Know what, your, know what your enemy is likely to be after. Know the techniques and tools that he's going to be using. Try them out yourself. See what you can learn from using them. Go out to the hacker sites. See what their, the current big interest thing is. That's it. And it's really easy to remember these. I've ordered, I can't take credit for, for, the, for this list. All I will take credit for is ordering in, in this particular way. Because no is at the top and the bottom. The second and fourth ones start with P. And the central concept is in the center. Okay. You ask about the iPhone passwords. There's the URL for the iPhone. If you want to get the zip tie and, and put it up, the zip tie chain, there's the URL for that one. And I've been collecting security bad practices for probably two years now to make this presentation. If you have, if you come across the security worst practice, um, I would appreciate it if you'd mail it to me because I'm always looking for new material. And nobody has a, um, a trump card on having all the bad security practices out there. There's lots of them. And I hope that by looking at what other people do wrong, we can figure out what's to do right. 
And we still have people writing down. Thank you. Okay. And there I am. Uh, send me email if you come up with it. If you find a security worth pra bad practice or worst practice that you think would be good for inclusion, send me email. I'd love to have it. Thank you. Thank you.